share his experience, strength, and hope for approximately 45 minutes. We ask out of respect for our speaker to please remain seated until he has finished. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this meeting, Craig. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. My name is Craig. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks, Mike, for inviting me out. Uh, some friends here. I'm glad you're here. Rick, Joy, Brenda, Garrett, a whole bunch of you. Um, I was thinking about uh, the name of this place, you know, uh, Safe Harbor. I thought, what, what a great name for an AA club, you know. And, and a Safe Harbor is safe if you have an anchor set. If you don't have an anchor, you're probably going to drift with the tide. And uh, this, this is a great place to set anchor and even drag anchor if you have to do that for a while. Um, you know, I'll, I'll share some of my story, but I, I did not, I was not an alcoholic when I came here, I can assure you that. <laughs> I, I was not. Um, I do have a home group. It's the Wadi group, the We Ain't Dead Yet group in Gilbert, Arizona. We meet Monday and Wednesday at 7 p.m. If you're ever in the neighborhood, please stop in. I'd like to thank all my friends on Zoom. I think it's 1,000. That's all it'll hold. So anyways, no. I'm just, but uh, anyways, no. Thanks, thanks everybody for coming here. This is actually the first time I spoke in a, in a live meeting, gosh, since March. I mean, other than a little three-minute spill and a couple of Zoom meetings. So uh, yeah, but it's, it's nice to be here. My sobriety date, I have one. It's uh, February 28th, 1987. Uh, I have a sponsor. He knows he's my sponsor. I sponsor guys. They know I'm their sponsor. Uh, Clancy was my sponsor, and Clancy just passed recently. I do have a sponsor in Phoenix, uh, Jim, Jim Muckess. And uh, anyways, great, great guy. And, uh, you know, I have a home group, I have a position in that home group, and I, I'm a member in good standing of Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? Um, I, I did not come here to get sober. I did not come here to find God. Um, actually, I, I, I got my first big book. I brought that tonight, and... Uh, I'm going to read just a little passage here. So this is, this is the first time I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. It says, For Craig, Saturday, November 3rd, 1984, your fifth day of sobriety at the Sawara Club, thanks for unlocking the Mazda, Ron Bond, and has his phone number. Uh, I was at the Sawara Club, and uh, some guy locked his keys in his car and I just I was pretty surprised that there weren't more alcoholics that didn't know how to get into locked cars <laughs> but uh, anyways and and he had he had a he had a trunk full of these big books you know hardcover and and he gave me one but uh and and I went to that meeting the only reason I went to that meeting was uh I was in college and in a psychiatry class and uh uh, one of the students in there had wrote, written a paper on the 12 steps. And for whatever reason, the professor broke his anonymity. And so I went up to this guy after, after class and I said, you know, he said something about going to meetings. And I said, hey, would you uh, take me to one of those meetings with you? And he said, sure. And so he, he took me and it was a Swore Club and it was uh, 34 West Dunlap, okay? And if you walk in there, I'm not very tall, but I had to duck, all right? And the fans were all, they were about ready to fall. The smoke was about six feet off the ceiling, you know? And everybody in there was about 100 plus, about as old as I am now, you know? And, uh, you know, and then, but there was, there was one gal in there, and uh, they were giving her a cake for one year. And I said, well, isn't that nice? I can give her a cake for... Uh, not drinking on the weekends or not drinking during the week. And they said, no, Craig, she didn't drink all year. I, I just, I didn't believe it. I, I couldn't wrap my mind around that. And there was another younger guy next to me and he tried to commit suicide the night before. 
So I thought, well, I need to help him. And then so I would talk to him and then talk to his wife on the phone and explain to her. And anyways, you know, I was here and I knew nothing about AA and I thought I was teaching it and I thought I was doing it. And what I know today is I was never here. I was window shopping. Okay, I, I came in here, I'm window shopping just in case if I'm ever an alcoholic, I'll see, you know, what's available. But I could tell very quickly that I was not one of you. And, and then, then this other lady said something about, she said, well, Craig, you're so smart, you're going to have to step over some dead ones before you get this program. And I thought, boy, you're a cold-hearted witch, you know. Uh, I can tell you, I was, I was a Paul Bear twice in my first two years of sobriety. The second one was uh, 25 years old. He died of liver failure and hepatitis. I remember my sponsor taking me to the funeral and he made me touch the body. And he said, that's untreated alcoholism. He says, it will kill you and it will kill me. And it scared me. I, uh, I thought I was as hard as you could be on the human body uh, Jack Daniels and Go Fast was my choice, and uh, you know I could go about three days maybe, and then I, I I would crash hard. But but this kid was dead. So anyways, I you know, and I went to one meeting a week. It was called the College Park Group. I went there because I was very smart, uh, very educated. I have a degree, and it was very important for me to let my sponsor know that I had a degree, and. Uh, he said, really, he said a lot of things, but he said, really, Craig? Well, then, if you're so smart, how come you're in AA on a Friday night? I didn't have an answer for that, you know? He'd say, you know, they got degrees on a thermometer. He, he goes, you know where the, we, we stick those? And, <laughs> and then he said, he said, let me tell you something about education on an alcoholic. He said, it's sort of like curly cue on a pig. He said it adds a little bit of flair and not much meat, you know? And uh, this guy, he just, he hurt my feelings a lot, a lot. And uh, thank God he wasn't afraid to hurt my feelings. He cared more about whether I got sober than whether or not he hurt my feelings. But, so, but before I got Gordy, so I did this, I did 90 days doing this one meeting a week. I made coffee. I didn't know there was meetings every night of the week. I didn't know you get a home group. I didn't know you get a sponsor at, at that time. And so at 90 days, I, I went out. And, and I planned on, my brother came to town. I was going to San Diego. We we're going to have fun, and I'll come back on Monday, OK? And uh, what happened was we went, got drunk. I wrecked an RV, did a lot of crazy stuff. And, uh, I crawled back to AA two years and eight months later. The only reason I know that is because I have this book with a date in it. In the period between then, I tried to, I had come to some meetings in between there. I came drunk. I always came drunk. I couldn't come sober. I tried to remember the prayer. I remember they said a short prayer, like a little three-line prayer, and I couldn't find it. And I read this book cover to cover more than once. Uh, it's not in here, okay? Serenity Prayer is not in this book. It's in the grapevine. But, of course, I was so smart, I, I didn't know that. So, you know, fast forward two years, eight months. I'm, uh, you know, I'm with this gal, and she says she can't foresee a relationship with me because of my drinking. So I thought, hmm, okay, I'm going to fix her. I'm going to get sober. I'll get her back. I'll dump her. And then, you know, I will, I will have one, okay? I mean, seriously, that, that was my mentality. Now, thank God, in the interim, in, in coming here and, and getting sober and, and getting a sponsor and getting involved and doing the steps, I realized it was, it was much, much, much more than uh, getting that girl back. Uh, we did get back together. We stayed together about five years, had a, had a wonderful five years, and uh, the truth was I, I was in a new house. We had a car and a truck. We had, she had a boy and a girl. We had a dog and a new house, and I'm flipping burgers on a grill in the backyard, and I didn't do nothing to earn any of it. I did nothing. And what I did was I sabotaged it. 
I sabotage it. I, everything I say is in retrospect, okay? Everything I say is from in, having been here, been through the steps many, many times, sponsors uh, doing the deal. But I didn't know it at the time, and, and I was scared to death. I was scared to death, and I sabotaged it. Um, so then after that, um, what I was going to do was Craig was going to work on Craig. Oh, my God. Well, you know, step away from yourself. You know, I, it got worse, okay? It, it got worse. But before I get into, I, I do want to, identify some. I think it's important to identify uh, because I'm an alcoholic. I didn't get to be an alcoholic from drinking milk. I didn't get to be an alcoholic from drinking Coke. I, you know, I love Coca-Cola. I've never sat down and drank a case of Coke, okay? So, uh, real quickly, born and raised in Wyoming. Had a mom and dad. Know where mom and dad's at. I have four brothers and a sister. I made it through school pretty much unscathed. A couple uh, suspensions for uh, drinking, smoking them left-handed cigarettes, um, you know, and, and having some dirty magazines at school, I, I, think, I think it was. Uh, other than that, n no big deals, okay? Got through grade school, junior high, high school. High school, ran away at 17. Uh, I ran away because uh, the girl I was going with, I was going to take her to a concert. My folks said, no, you're grounded. I said, do anything else. Don't ground me. I'm going to the concert. And so, anyways, I ran away that night, left them a note, said, leave me alone. I'll finish school. Uh, they did. I did. I went to that concert. It was REO Speedwagon. I was in the parking lot. I had a, a hundred lot of them white things, uh, white crosses, sort of dates myself. And, uh, and I had a fifth of Jack Daniels. And I was laying in the seat and I was watching the mirror because my folks were at the front door and I was waiting for them to leave so I could go in. They left, I went in. I, I was so drunk, I don't even remember the concert. Um, I was about four years sober before my dad reminded me that I also uh, got fired from my first job that night for calling in sick. Uh, I, was, I was working at UPS. So anyways, I, I, I finished school. Um, I, I ran away like two, two blocks up the street with my best friend, right? And about two weeks later, my, my family, my mom, dad, and brothers, they all moved. They moved to a smaller town in Wyoming. And I thought, oh, wow, this is for real, you know? So anyways, I, I finished school, and they came to my graduation. I didn't invite them, but they came. And they, they asked me if I want to move back home, and I thought, well, sure. I didn't have anywhere else to go. So we, we moved to Green River, Wyoming. Anybody ever hear of that place? There's a couple of hands there. It's small. It's smaller than it is today. It was like 3,000 people. It grew to like 10,000 people in two weeks. Green River is an oil-filled town. It's a Trona mine town. It's railroad, and, uh, you know, it's a drinking town. Okay, you can drink 24-7, nobody will look at you twice, you can have open containers in your car, you can walk down the street with a beer, a bottle in your hand, nobody will say anything. Everybody works shift, 6 a.m., 6 p.m., they don't care. My kind of town. I get a job at the railroad, I'm making good money, I make about 500 bucks a week, I have zero bills, zero. No rent, no food, no nothing, and... Uh, I get paid on Friday, and on Monday, I'm borrowing lunch money. And drinks, well, my dad owned a bar. I recommend that if you're alcoholic, you know. <laughs> I drink top shelf booze for free and still be broke. And, uh, you know, it, it was wonderful. Uh, I, I bought a new truck, and uh, so then we, we go partying. If, if you ever party in a small town, what do you do? You drive to another town because there's nothing going on in your town, right? So we drive over to another town. We got drunk. It's Christmas time. We're coming back. And uh, I come to on a gurney with uh, my parents and cops next to me telling me my brother didn't make it and having me sign a DUI. Now, I was 20 years old. Uh, never had any problems with the cops, never 
I, I just, I couldn't believe what I heard, you know? I mean, you read about stuff like that and you hear about stuff like that, but it happens to other people. And uh, I just couldn't believe, so immediately I say I hurt and I don't hurt, they give me a shot of something. Um, and that, w that was that, so. That doesn't make me alcoholic, okay? I was alcoholic way before this act. I was born alcoholic. I, I know that today. I did not know that then. So with my best plans, my best intelligence, my plan now is to drink and drive. Because sober as I'm up here tonight, I could have taken a gun and blown my brains out. No problem. But I couldn't put mom and dad and the rest of my brothers or my sister through any more pain. So now I'm, I'm going to drink and drive, and I'll die. And they'll say, poor Craig, look what happened to him. You know, same thing that happened to Carl. And so I did that plan for 10 years. This was 1977, OK? And I got sober in 1987. So it, it's, it's 10 years. And I gave it my best shot. And I ran hard, and I drank hard, and I wrecked a lot more vehicles. I didn't kill anybody else, thank God, or myself. Uh, I wrecked some vehicles. I did some DUIs. I, I never did any time. Uh, D DUI laws, are, they're, they're so much different today, and especially Arizona's got the toughest DUI laws in the country. Um, had the laws been in effect that today as then, I'd, I'd be in prison forever, forever. You know, because it doesn't matter if you drink and drive and kill your mother, brother, sister, father today, you're going to prison for a long, long time. So about 10 years of running and gunning, and uh, the alcohol worked for a long time. The alcohol would shut my mind off. It would allow me to live with what I had done. It was the only thing that would shut this off a little bit. I went to a lot of doctors, a lot of psychiatrists, a lot of counselors, a lot of sociologists, a lot of different places. My parents tried to help me, a lot of doctors, a lot of people tried to help me. Um, I, didn't know, I didn't know what was wrong with me. Nobody ever said, Craig, you're an alcoholic. And if they did, I never heard it. I never, ever heard it. And uh, so now, though, I'm, I'm 10 years into this deal, and, and, and I just, the alcohol doesn't work anymore. The alcohol will not shut this off anymore. I can't get drunk enough. I can't stay drunk. I can't get drunk. I can't get sober. And so now I'm, I'm going to do this. Now I, I am going to do it. But I am an academic, so I like checking boxes off the list. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I should give this a and a, a try, OK? And so I, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. and. Uh, like I said, I went into that Sawara Club, and I thought, oh, my God, this is the bottom of the barrel. I mean, learned men, lots of them, could not fix me. And so now, you know, a bunch of drunks are going to fix me. I thought, yeah, yeah this ain't going to work. And then I, I would go to meetings, and, and they're reading that, the, the fifth chapter and the 12 traditions at every meeting. I thought, you know. How long does it take to get that? You know, I mean, come on, people. You know, really, I mean, you know, I'm not a, a quick study, but, you know, after a couple times, I got it, you know. And so it's amazing, in spite of my arrogance, in spite of my pride, in spite of myself, God seen fit that I could stay here. And so, and I ain't come here, like I said, not to be an alcoholic, not to find God, not to... What I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm going to prove AA don't work because so I can go do this. And uh, so they said, well, if you want to join AA, you got to get a, you got to get a home group and you got to get a sponsor, you know. And they said, uh, they said, if you want to join Coffee Drinkers Anonymous, you can do that. And if you want to join Grab Ass Anonymous, you can do that, you know, or Meeting Goers Anonymous. But they said, if you want to get sober, you got to join Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and, and, and have a sponsor. So I listened to guys for a little while, and I listened to this one guy, and he had a pretty tough story, or he sounded sort of tough, so I said, well, I'll ask him, you know, and, and so I did. And so we, we went to coffee after every meeting. None of the meetings started before 8.30. We had 
coffee, cake, pie after every meeting, you know, it, thank God, it, it saved my life. But I, I got this guy, Gordy, as my first sponsor, and so I thought he, he was a pretty nice guy, or at least in the meetings, he looked pretty nice. But then when we went to coffee, he just sort of, he set me in this booth, and me and him got in this booth, and everybody else was over here having cake and ice cream, and, and he just started reading me the riot act, you know. You're going to read this book. You're going to call me every day. You're going to uh, sit in the front two rows. You're not going to get up and go to the bathroom. You're not going to get up and get coffee. You're not going to talk to women. You're not going to get women's phone numbers. You're, you're not going to talk. He says, if you get called on, you can state your name and your disease, but Craig, I don't want you carrying the mess. He's, you know, he hurt my feelings. And he said, he said, you're going to ask for help. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, I, I don't believe in this God stuff. He said, I didn't ask you to believe. He says, you're going to ask for help in the morning, and if you don't drink, you're going to thank him at night. I went home that night with my five days of sobriety. I was alone, and I got on my knees, and I said a prayer. I said, God, if you're out there, please help me. I'd rather die than go on living the way I've been living. And something happened in that room. Something happened. God didn't talk to me, but something happened. I felt warm. I felt okay. I knew to my inner core that if I don't drink, everything's going to be all right. I can tell you from that day to this day, I have not wanted to drink. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. I could not not drink. I would, I would go to my brother's grave, and I would swear that I'm not going to drink, and I'm going to make something of my life, and I'm going to do something worthwhile, and I'm going to go to school, and I'm going to do this. And I would go down the hill, and I'd be drunk the same day or the next, never more than three days. Ne I could not not drink. And I said one prayer to a God I didn't believe in, and he removed the obsession to drink. You know, I didn't know it right then. Thank God I didn't. You know, I would have thought, oh, wow, you know, I got to get out of here. Or I would have, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I didn't know it that night, that week. I, at one year, when I, when I got one year of sobriety, and, and I remember I, I woke up, I didn't come, and the birds were singing. And it used to be when the birds were singing and I came to, I wanted to get my shotgun and shoot them because they just annoyed me. And I had a hangover and it just, but anyways, I had a year and uh, I had a thought. I thought, maybe this will work for me. Maybe this will work for me because I knew it would work for you guys. I'd seen it work for you, but I thought I was worse, or I was bad, or I was, uh, I was, I was not worthy. I, I didn't feel that I deserved to be happy. I didn't feel I deserved to be sucking air. I didn't feel I deserved to have anything nice. And I can tell you, it, you know. It, and, I, and I've I've done a lot of work on this, and 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 it, it's man. I mean, I used to just sit up there and babble and cry through the whole thing. And and God bless all of you because nobody ever told me to shut up, and nobody ever told me to quit talking about it. They allowed me to talk about it until until I could talk about it. And it, and it just takes what it takes, you know. I was 12 years sober before I bought myself a truck. I could afford a truck, but I wouldn't buy one. I was 12 years sober before I fixed my gun. I was, wasn't sure who I would use it on. I was, uh, you know, it was 12 years sober before I really, I, I decided that it was okay to be okay. You know, this, this tragic, horrific accident um, didn't have to define my whole life. But I, I can tell you, it, it, it definitely has shaped a, a, a lot of it, even without knowing it. I can tell you, like this year I went through a divorce, okay? And I, I was never married. In, I was 60 years old before I got married, so I, I was only married two and a half years. But 
I was not going to get married for a couple of reasons because if, if I get married, I'm going to get divorced, and then if we get divorced, then I'm going to have to kill her, you know. And, uh, you know, because here, here's the deal. If, if I love you and if I give you all of me, then you can hurt me. You can devastate me. And when my brother died, it hurt so much that I said, and I didn't even know I said this, but I said, I'm going to never hurt like this again. I'm going to never love anybody, and I will never hurt like this again. You know? And, and I can tell you, it took 21 years in this program and whatever it's been, 12, 13 years, I've been in the sister program, Al-Anon. Al-Anon has helped me greatly with that, greatly. I was at a, well, I guess it's not, it's a friend's the lowest meeting this morning that I go to on Saturday mornings when I'm here. I love it. Uh, Brenda's over there always, and, uh, you know, they. I thought they were the enemy camp. I thought they were, you know, over there, I don't know, talking about us alcoholics or you know all the bad anyways it uh I had to go over there to learn about love to learn about detachment to learn about learn about me it'll be, it was okay to be me so I'm I got this sponsor I'm, I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous now you know and so now I'm, I'm going to these meetings and uh Gordy got a meeting book, and we hadn't meeting books back in those days. We didn't have uh, cell phones, you know. We didn't, and uh, he circled. He said, "You're going to go to." He's uh, he circled the meeting every night, every every night. He said, "I said every night, yeah, for ninety." I said, "I said, well, that's a little extreme, isn't it?" He said, "Well, in your case, we're gonna we're gonna make an exception. You only have to go to two meetings a week." I said, oh, wow, that's great. I said, which ones? He says, uh, today and tomorrow, <laughs> you know? And I was like, you know, these guys, they, they like send them to sponsor school, you know, or something. They, they got an answer for everything, you know? I mean, I told him, I said, I don't believe in God. Why don't you believe in God? I ain't never seen him. He says, you believe in Abraham Lincoln? I said, yeah, you know? I was like, where do they come up with these questions, you know? But... So anyway, so he, and he circled, so I had to go to a big book meeting, and I had to go to a 12 and 12, which is our tradition meeting, and then I had to go to a speaker meeting. And he said, the others you can choose. But he said, you know, the discussion meetings are sort of, he said, ah, they're hit and miss, you know. But he says, if you're in the literature, if you're in the book, it's our message. You can't go wrong. If it's in this book, and he said, you got to read the black part. Don't read the white part in between, you know. And, uh, you know, he, he just had an answer for everything. And, uh, you know, he said, you're going to read the first two pages. Well, they're blank. He said, that's all right. I just want to make sure you're looking, you know. And uh, so, anyways, I have to call him every day. And then I go to a meeting every day. And then I was at this meeting, and somebody asked me to read. And so I read. And so he calls me up. He says, I heard you were speaking. And Gordy knew. He knew everybody in every meeting. He, and he calls. He goes, I heard you were speaking in a meeting. I said, well, I, somebody asked me to read. He says, well, okay, that's all right. But, you know, he's, he says, you're not going to talk until we get through the steps, at least, you know, halfway through the ninth step. Because he says, you know, we, we have way too many people teaching AA that I haven't even been through AA and he said it waters down AA he said did you like your whiskey watered down Hell no. I drank whiskey out of the bottle or on the rocks that that was it um, beer and wine I, I didn't think beer and wine was liquor I when I drank just beer and wine I, I considered myself quitting drinking you know <laughs> I mean I want liquor I want to get downtown now you know I mean, right now, I, I, none of this slow, none of this sippy. They've come out with so many drinks since I sobered up that, you know, Zima or whatever, Zuma, I don't know, whatever it was. I thought that was water, you know. I thought, no, but anyways, so 
so anyways, I get this home group, and then he says, well, you, you, you got to get a position. And, and thank the greeters that were, were out there tonight. I'm glad, you know, they used to, the greeters, used, they used to call them sniffers. And the purpose of the greeters were to sort of lean in and greet you, but they were also sort of sniffing so we could tell if you'd been drinking. So then they would go get somebody that had been sober to, you know, go talk to them. That was the way, you know, it was, it was identification. There was, there was a purpose for, there's a purpose for all our madness, you know. But then he said, he said, well, you got to make coffee. And I'm like, make coffee? I got a degree, you know. What, what the hell does making coffee got to do with me getting sober? He said, well, he said, you're going to make coffee for a year, you know. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. But see, I, I didn't know you could say no to your sponsor. I didn't know you could say F you. I, I didn't know. I, don't, I just, I didn't know. And thank God I didn't know. Thank God I didn't know because I was desperate enough. I was teachable. I was teachable. I was willing. If you told me to roll a marble down Central Avenue with my nose, I would have done it. I would have done it because I didn't want what I had. And I wasn't sure what you had, but I wanted some of it because I would come here and you guys would be laughing and you'd be have a little twinkle in your eye and, and you know, you just, and I'd, I'd be waiting out, I was like, there was damn little laugh about when I got here, you know, I, it, I, I wasn't laughing, okay, you know, he, I'd tell him, well, how smart I was and he said, really, well, let's see, let's see, you're 29 years old, you're living with daddy, you're driving daddy's truck. You're about ready to uh, lose your job. And, uh, you know, he says, what's, what's so great about your life? You know, and I, God, I, how's he know? I didn't tell him that. How, how's he know that? And then when I came, or the first night, now it was February, and it was in Arizona, and it used to be cold in February, believe it or not. And I had on short shorts and a tank top, and I was sweating and I was shaking, and they all knew I was new. And I thought, how the hell do they know I'm new, you know? I was like, these, these people, they, and then, but he was always three steps ahead of me, at least three weeks, three months, because he would tell me, he said, Craig, he said, you know, he said, you're, 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 not, you're young enough, you're going to feel good enough that you're going to spring out of bed, and you're, you're going to think you're not alcoholic. And that was exactly right. By the third day, man, now maybe not, maybe about the fifth day, you know. The, for five days, I, I shook some. I didn't sleep really well. I uh, tossed and turned a lot. I had, you know, hot and cold sweats. Um, but then I was like, then it just, it just sort of quit, you know. I'm like, damn, I might have overreacted, you know. But... <laughs> But he told me, he said, your mind's going to tell you you're not alcoholic. He said, alcoholism is the only disease that if you've ever had the thought that, that you might be alcoholic, he says, he says you are. He said, non-alcoholics don't have that thought. People, people that aren't alcoholic don't sit there and wonder, well, I wonder if I'm alcoholic. He said, well, Craig, he said, you're in an AA meeting on a Friday night. You know, look around. There, there aren't any non-alcoholics in here, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so anyways, he got me involved. And after, after a year, I, I didn't want to give up my, so now i got to let somebody else make coffee and set the chairs. Nobody else can do it, right? I mean, I got it down. I got it perfect. Oh, one other real quick. Uh, they made decaf coffee. And I said, well, I don't drink decaf. So I made regular coffee. Well, some of them got upset. So they said, well, we got to have group conscience. And so they had group conscience. So I sort of won in the sense they told me I could make decaf and regular, you know. But, uh, and not, but they always, you know, they always don't tell the group what you're doing if you, if you don't want a group conscience. Don't get a sponsor even. If you don't want to get sober, don't get a sponsor because don't ever tell them nothing. Because then I, I tell my sponsor, well, tax time was coming up. And I was supposed to pay the IRS some money. And uh, I could just, with a little lie, I'd, I wouldn't have to pay him anything. You know, and I, I thought, hell, I, I could still sleep, you know. 
And he says, Craig, he says, you can't be honest here in AA and dishonest over here outside of AA. He said, this is, you're, you got to be all in. You, you got, it's like in that, that poker deal they have on TV or they used to have, you know. God wants me all in. Anything that I put in front of my sobriety, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. So, anyways, he said, he said, pay him the money. And so, I did, I, I wrote him a check. I wrote it out to communist pigs. And, <laughs> and I feel, and they cashed my check. <laughs> and they never said anything. Now, I shared, I've shared that in a few meetings. And one gal told me, she goes, I just got nasty with them on the phone. They audited me. But, uh. Anyways, I'll tell you what, I wrote that check, and I slept peaceful, and I, you know, I'm, I'm an open book. Everything I do, everything that I have, uh, you know, is a, is a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. I take another position, I did, I've held all the positions at home group and many at, at many at the, uh, intergroup level and many at the area level and uh, you know uh, service has been I've never not had a commitment at least once a week since I've been sober and the truth is it's never been just once a week and many times that saved me I can tell you in the beginning I always had a commitment at Thanksgiving and at Christmas because I, I know it was actually one of these counts. I was actually seeing this counselor, and she was like scheduling my appointment. And I said, "Well, we can't have it on that day because I'll be depressed because my brother's birthday was coming up." You know, and she goes, "Oh, well, at least you're scheduling your depression now." You know, <laughs> and I, I thought, "Well, you bitch," you know. <laughs> but you know, see, you know, only people, you know, when they say that stuff out loud, you're like, "Oh, yikes, yeah, okay." But anyways, I would make sure I had a commitment because I did get depressed at, at Thanksgiving and at Christmas time, you know, and, and I hated those holidays for many years, for many years. And I loved them as a kid and growing up. I, I, I didn't love anything more than Thanksgiving and Christmas. My birthday's around Thanksgiving. Um, but for years, I, I hated people that were happy. I hated people that, sm I just hated all people. And the truth was, I hated me. I hated me. And I didn't care anything about myself, and I cared less about you, you know. And it was just a dark, dark. I wanted to die every single day for 10 years. I wanted to not wake up. I wanted to not be here. Um, and I come here, and I say a prayer, and I do what you tell me to do, and I, and I get a wonderful life. You know, the, the difference between psychiatry and Alcoholics Anonymous, and psychiatrists, they tried to get me to think my way into right acting, okay? It, it didn't work. But in here, they didn't care what I thought. They said they made me take action. You're going to make coffee. You're going to be secretary. You know, you're going to be treasurer. You're going to be chip getter, you know. I was, I was the chip guy for a while, and then I got 18 months. 18 month chips just come out back then in 88 I think it was anyways and uh, so me and Rodney both had 18 months so I took the group's money went down the intergroup bought some chips and came back to Maryville and I said uh, me and Rodney are getting 18 month chips tonight and they said well Maryville doesn't give 18 month chips <laughs> I said well they do now and so I gave me and Rodney a chip that night and they had to have a group meeting and, and, and I lost. Oh, I was pissed. I had a resentment. I don't think I put that money back in the basket. I think I was seven, ten years sober. Serious. I, I was resentful. But now I'm like them. I'm called the 18, that's a whiner's chip. You know, you got, you got to get a full year. You know, I remember Leo, Leo would say, well, how sober, how long are you sober? I said, well, seven and a half years or whatever. And he'd say, Craig, when you ask an infant, how old they are. They'll, they'll say like four and a half or three and a half. He said, how many years sober? Seven. Okay. All right. Don't forget it. You know, uh, you know, they, they're just hard asses, you know, they're not like 
today, man, it's, I don't know, any, anybody will, Gordy, he told me, he said, you don't want to do this, that's all right. He said, ask somebody else. He said, anybody in the AA will sponsor you. He said, you know, it, they don't care, you know. But if I'm going to sponsor you, you're going to do all this stuff. So then he, he got me into, uh, well, I did the PICPC, that's uh, Public Information Cooperation Professional Community. I talked at several schools and some colleges and some health fairs and stuff like that. And, and, and I enjoyed that. But then I, I got into this deal, H&I, Hospitals and Institutions. And, and I really felt I found my calling. And at first I did the jails. Um, but I go to the jails and these, these guys, they're smoking in back and yakking it up. And you know, they just, they just wanted to get out of their cell and smoke a cigarette. So, oh, and I was talking to Mike something about this because like before I go down there, I, I take my watch off and I'd sort of, I wouldn't dress very nice. And, uh, because I tell Gordy, I said, well, I, I don't want to look like I'm, you know, too uppity or whatever. He said, bullshit. He said, when you go to that meeting, you dress as sharp as you can, you put on your best watch and your best shoes, and you go show them what Alcoholics Anonymous has given you. And, uh, and so I, I, I did that. And I, I found my calling in prisons. I did uh, prisons for 20 years. I never did any time for my accident or anything. Um, I never did any time behind bars. I did a lot of time in my head. They, uh, you know, the judge slapped me on the hands and said, poor you, you lost your brother, and, you know, and that was it. They took my license. I don't, I don't even remember, maybe 60, 90, I don't, I don't know. I didn't want to drive anyways, uh, you know, so it, it was a mute point. But there was no, no official, you know, punishment that and uh, so I'm, I'm going out these prisons now and I'm and I'm talking and I'm sort of as you can imagine I'm, I'm becoming quite an authority you know I'm uh, Mr. AA don't you know and by God you better listen and I'm gonna get you sober and you know I was uh, I was preaching okay and I was, I was not doing them much good or myself but I was working with this guy, Rocky. Rocky was doing 10 years flat for a double vehicular manslaughter that he didn't remember. The judge had to tell him what happened. And when he told me that, he leveled me, he humbled me. I realized that I should be wearing orange, I should be sitting in a prison chair, and, you know, that's what happened to me. Now, I told him, you know, that I was messing with the tape deck. That's the last thing I remember. But I know today I blacked out, you know. Three of us went through the front windshield at 55, da-da-da. Anyways, um, so Rocky leveled me, and uh, it, really, it, it really changed my whole attitude and uh, really made me want to share rather than teach. Because that's, that's really all I can do here is, is, is share my story, share, share what happened to me. Because I just I just knew that this wasn't going to work, you know. I can tell you, I know we're getting short on time already, darn it. But so I come here from Wyoming, okay. I'm white and right, and if you're not, you're not. I'm uh, I'm very homophobic and I'm very prejudiced, and I don't know I am, but I am. And uh, so I I don't like Mexicans. The reason I don't like Mexicans, I'm nine years old. We're on food stamps. Me and my brother are walking home. Uh, with the groceries and these Mexicans tell us they're going to cut our fingers off and t steal our groceries. It scares me to death. I'm nine years old. I believe them. I, you know, I carried that forever. One of the first guys I sponsored in AA, Mexican Johnny, he raised himself from 12th Street and Van Buren down in Phoenix. I mean, that is a rough, rough area. Johnny would lift his shirt. He said, that's a bullet wound. That's a knife wound. That's a bullet wound. He had a metal plate in his head. He was left for dead, and his, him and his brother and a drug deal gone bad. And uh, Johnny loved me. I helped Johnny learn how to read and write and took him through the steps. And uh, we go into a restaurant to eat, and Johnny would say, Craig, they're dissing you. You want me to kick their ass? And I said, no, Johnny, no. We, we quit fighting, you know? I love Johnny. Uh, another thing, homo homophobic, I, and then I heard there were some in these rooms, and so in saying the Lord's Prayer, I would try to get between a couple of gals, and uh, 
So at five years sober, this guy asked me to sponsor him, and I said, sure, and we, I do, and we go to the restaurant, and I take him over there and say, okay, so where do you go to meetings, and what do you do? And, you know, he goes, well, I go to Mid-City, and I go to Lambda, and I said, you what? I said, are you gay? He goes, yes. He goes, I got to be honest, don't I? I said, yeah, I'll be honest with you. Five years ago, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm out of So I don't know what to do. So I say a prayer. <clears throat> and this is what comes to me. I don't get up here and say, my name's Craig, and I'm a heterosexual, and I'm an alcoholic. Okay? So I told Joel, I said, Joel, as long as you don't have an attraction towards me, we can go through the steps. And then Joel said he did not. I didn't know if that was a compliment or an insult, you know? I was like, what, what the hell, you know? I, but anyways, I, I took Joel through the steps. Joel taught me more about love than any other person ever had. Joel had lost a lover of 27 years. He wasn't able to grieve with his own family or the other family because he wasn't out. I never tried to be somebody I wasn't. I, I was just an alcoholic. I drank as much as I could, as often as I could. If you're good with that, great, let's go. If you're not, tough, you know? I didn't, like, try to have a girlfriend to try to be normal to... I, I didn't... That was a whole nother level that I, I didn't even understand, you know? Um, so what I've learned is, is my prejudice, my arrogance is out of... <coughs> it's out of ignorance. It's out of ignorance or it's out of fear, you know? The full circle of that story, 14 years sober, my brother comes to me, who's a captain in the Air Force and plays football, and he tells me he's gay. And he's got a stack of books. He's also got a master's in theology. And uh, I said, that's all right, Kevin. Just be who you are. I love you. That... That would not have happened. That could not have happened without this. I can tell you, Gordy hugged me. He was the first man to ever hug me. And he hugged me in the meeting. And he was sort of like, you know, it was like one of them that's too long. You know what I mean? And, and he, I could sort of, he said, yeah, Craig, everybody's looking. And I'm, God, you know, I just like, but then, and then I'd sort of try it. You know, I sort of try hugging my dad. And it, it, it didn't feel right. It got to where I felt right, you know. I got 30 wonderful years with my dad before he died. You know, he's buried over here, World War II vet. I've made all my amends that I know of, that I owe. Uh, things are right with my dad and my mom, all my brothers, my sisters. Um, I have a blessed life. I have a blessed life because I was a pig because I drank as much as I could, as often as I could, and, and I get this wonderful life. I've traveled all over the world, and, and not on Zoom. I mean, I have on Zoom also, but I mean, I, you know, all over the world, I go to AA everywhere I go, you know, to Switzerland, to Italy, to Ireland, to Mexico, to Bermuda, Canada, I, all over, many places, many places twice. Um, sometimes I can't, I don't even know the language. I can't even, but I can feel it. When I'm in the room, I can feel the heart, talk to the heart, and I'm just, I'm okay. Uh, if you're new, or even if you've been here a while, if you ain't plugged in, man, get plugged in. Uh, you know, it's, it's, we, it's the action. It's the action. A, it doesn't care what I know. It doesn't care. It, it's the actions that I take. I need to keep doing this. You know, 32 years, 33 years of sobriety ain't going to keep me sober tomorrow. You know, what I do today. Um, I thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous. I thank you people for showing me my God. Thank you. Let's give Craig one more hand. <laughs>